Hey guys, thanks for joining us today. We believe that God's Word has the power to change lives. So grab a pen and paper and get ready for this message. And so in this series, Counterculture, we've been looking at Romans chapter 12, where it tells us not to be conformed to the ways of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind. And we've been addressing different areas of, of worldliness and worldly culture that has begun to slip into the church. And, and, and I think a lot of times these things kind of subtly come into our, our life and in our homes and the way that we think. And, and a lot of times it comes in through different avenues, even something as like a TV show or something that we, we watch. I remember when I was growing up and, and a teenager and everything, there was a show that was on called Everybody Loves Raymond. Come on, how many of you remember that show? And, and Raymond was a sports writer, but he wasn't, he wasn't winning Father of the Year anytime soon. He, he was always disconnected. Half the time you didn't even see where the kids were in the show. He didn't know how to take care of them or anything. He was, he was, he was just kind of worried about sports, worried about golf, worried about watching TV, all of these things. And, and then the wife was always, you know, talking down to him, treating him like he was an idiot and everything. And while we all laugh at that and everything, because it was a funny TV show, a lot of times we allow some of those practices and those mentalities to sink into our home. And we allow the culture to begin to dictate the way that we run our home instead of allowing the Word of God to dictate the way that we run our home. You know, here at the church, we, we put a high focus on, uh, uh, on having healthy families. And so we preach a lot about marriage. We preach a lot to our men about what it means to be a, a man of God. We've had men's conferences, you know, Band of Brothers, all these different services and things. And many of the times we talk to you uh, men about having a vision for your home and having direction for your home. That if God has placed you as the head of the home, then he will speak to you a purpose and a plan for your family so that you're going to accomplish an eternal perspective in in the time that you have with your kids and with your wife and and you kind of focus on that and and we talk about that and and many of you men have have adopted that and you know uh, about how, how back says to write out the vision make it plain many of you men have even talked about the vision with your family and your kids and what you feel like God has called you to do as a family and, and you're kind of implementing that but sometimes you don't see the spiritual fruit that you want from it Sometimes you feel like God's kind of giving you a vision, but you don't see things coming to pass the way that you would hope that they would come to pass in. And, you know, when I was in Honduras a couple weeks ago, uh, we were there on a missions trip. We had a team there. And as you're traveling down Honduras, you see all these different fruit trees everywhere. There's mango trees. There's banana trees. And they're just growing on the side of the hill. It's not even something like it was planted. And you will see, like, just all these bananas just growing on that. And you see all this fruit and, and everything. Everything that is there and just very kind of prosperous and fruitful tree. But how many of you know if you would take one of those trees, one of those banana trees, and you bring it here and you plant it outside on this hillside, how many know that thing's going to die? The first winter, it's going to kill it. The first time it tries to go down deep and it finds nothing but rock, it's going to die. It's not going to have the heat, the sun, the, everything that it needs in order to bring forth the fruit. Why? Because the, even the most fruitful tree in the wrong environment is not going to bring forth the fruit that it desires to. And sometimes we can have the most fruitful vision for our home, but if we're not, if we don't have the right environment or the right culture within our home, no matter how fruitful the vision is or the dream that God's placed in our heart, it's not going to bring forth the fruit that we desire it to until we change the culture. We have to make our homes a culture and, that is conducive to grow the vision that God has given us and placed inside of our heart. And so what I'm going to give you this morning is I'm going to ask you three questions. And these three questions are not all inclusive. These are just starter questions that I feel like can help you create an environment in which the, the vision that God has given you, and some of you, you don't even have a vision for your home yet, but as you begin to seek God for a vision for your home, then that vision can begin to grow and prosper as you create the right culture. The first question is this, is do your wife and your children know their value 
I think this is an extremely important question today. And I think that this one probably is, is one of the most important things that, that, that we have to address in our homes. Because if our children and our wives don't know their value, or we don't, we, we're not showing them their value, then no matter what we try to lead, they're not going to accomplish it because they don't know how precious they are. They don't know their value. Listen, men, if you are lucky enough to have convinced some woman to marry you, then you know what? Scripture says that he who has found a wife finds a good thing. And all the men said, come on, that was a good chance to get bonus points and brownie points there. Hopefully you... Scripture says that, that a wife that is serving the Lord, that her value is far above rubies or jewels. And so one of the questions that I have to ask you this morning is to... Does your wife understand her value? Does your wife understand that, that when you look at her, you don't see someone who nags you or complains or, or is, is an inconvenience or gets in your way of having fun or, or whatever, but you see someone who is a blessing to you, someone who is of high value to you. And sometimes we can say that we value our wife, and we may even say the right words, oh, I love you, you're so beautiful, and we can tell them all those things. But sometimes, the way that we act and decisions we make, instead of showing them their value, it devalues them. When they come to us with a concern or something that's a heavy weight that's on their heart, and we just kind of belittle it and be like, oh, come on, it, it's fine, don't worry about it, we're good, this is what we're doing. Instead of taking the time to listen and at least validate and take time to pray about that, you know what we're saying? We value these other things or this other process and stuff more than what we value you. Or maybe you've had plans to go to a big game or, or go on a hunting trip or something and you come home and you realize that your wife is completely stressed out from the kids because they're acting crazy. Come on, how many of you know your kids can be a little crazy every now and then? They're fighting, they're arguing, and you see all of that. And you just go on your trip. Or you just go to the game. Or you just go shoot the round of golf. You know what you've communicated to your wife? That my golf round or my hunting trip or watching this game is more important than your sanity. <laughs> and it's very important that we understand that a lot of times it's our actions that convey value more than what our words do. And many times the reason why we devalue our wives and kids is because we overvalue ourselves. We overvalue our opinion, our desires, our will, what we want, and we devalue them. But I'm going to tell you something, in the world that we're in today, if your wife and kids, if you want to divorce-proof your home, one of the ways that you divorce-proof your home is making sure that your wife knows that she is the most beautiful, precious thing, blessing that God has ever given you. That would keep her from having some other man who listens to her. Because a lot of the times, the reason why when, the, when, when a woman leaves the home, the reason why the woman leaves the home is because they're neglected by the husband and somebody shows them interest or attention. And so they desire that, and their heart turns toward the person who's shown them the interest and attention. You, do, you need to make sure that there is no other man on earth who can love and show attention and everything towards your wife the way that you do. And the same thing, you need to do it with your kids, especially if you have daughters. Because in the world today, they completely devalue women. Women are a piece of meat. Women are something to be conquered. Women are something to look at. Women are something to, 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 to just be another uh, mark on your bedpost. And even in the days when I grew up in school, the whole, the whole thing was trying to sleep with them. But now it's not even trying to sleep with them. It's trying to, send them in, trying to get them to send inappropriate pictures to you. 
And there are more and more people inside the church and, and girls who love God and, and, and really are, are good kids overall, but because they don't feel valued and don't understand their value and some knucklehead teenage boy begins to show them attention, then they, they don't see and know their value. And so they are sending inappropriate pictures and videos and all of these things. A lot of times to people they don't even really know because they don't understand their value. And a lot of times it comes through the aspect of social media. And I, I just want to encourage you parents, I'm going to say this real quick and then I'll get off of it, off my soapbox. But if you, in, if you have, your kids have social media, then you need to make sure either that you have some way to kind of track what's going on. And one social media platform that nobody needs to be on is Snapchat. Because I'm just telling you right now, Snapchat is nothing but an environment for sexual content and things to be displayed with no evidence or proof of it later. And it is one thing where there are child pedophiles and everything. It's a thing where teenagers and, and older men are convincing young girls into sending inappropriate pictures and, and all of these things. And the problem is, is after 24 hours, it's deleted. There's no evidence of it. And they won't even participate and help out with police and any investigations, all of this. It is nothing but a sex ring in social media. And I know y'all are like, Pastor, you crazy. No, I'm telling you the truth. I'm watching. I'm seeing families and girls who don't understand their value, allowing themselves to be devalued and stuff by some knucklehead boy. One of the most important things that you can do, men, is show your daughters how valuable they are and make sure that they know that, it, that the minute that anybody would even ask them for something, that is the first sign of proof that they are, no, they are nobody that even needs to be considered because they, they, they're not worth it. Because they don't value their daughter. And if you don't value your daughter, you're going to have somebody who's going to pull her away with some words and say that they value and get her to compromise her true value. And most parents think, well, that's not going to happen to me until it does. And I'm just telling you guys, we got we to begin to shut those doors. You need to value your kids enough to be involved in their life and know what's going on on their phones. Not only do you need to teach your daughters their value, but you need to teach your sons that they need to value women. That they are not a trophy, that they are not something to be conquered, that they are not, but they are God's princesses. They are God's daughter that they are a special gift that doesn't need to be unwrapped until it's time there needs to quit being the sneak peeks into the gift before it's time to unwrap the gift how many of you people ever went and opened up your christmas gifts and kind of looked in a little bit and you closed it and you our teenagers and can I go a little bit farther? Our eight, nine, ten year olds are opening up gifts that they are not emotionally, physically, spiritually, or anything ready to handle. And we need to teach them their value. But a lot of reasons that we don't, as I said, is because we overvalue ourselves and undervalue our kids. Because we've looked at scriptures like Ephesians chapter 5, go ahead and pull that at verse 22, where it says, Wives, submit to your own husbands, even as to the Lord, and for your husband is the head of the wife, and Christ is the head of the church. His body is himself the Savior, and the church is submitted to Christ, so wives ought to submit to their husbands and everything. We look at scriptures like this, and we say, well, if I'm the head, then that means my value is here, my wife's value is here, and my kid's value is somewhere down here. And that's not what Christ is saying in here. Because if you go look at the rest of Scripture, and we're going to get more into this passage, but if you go look at other places in Scripture, 1 Peter chapter 3 talks about uh, husband and wife and a relationship within a home. And 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7 says, Likewise, husbands, you need to live with your wives in an understanding way. 
So in other words, when your wife comes to you and she's broken and she's fearful and she's concerned about something, you don't just sit there and belittle what she says and, oh, get over it. You're just being emotional. And that's crazy talk. And just, look, I, I'll handle this. Don't worry about all this stuff and belittle them. But you understand that God has made them more sensitive for a reason. Because sometimes that sensitivity picks up on things that you never would pick up on. And they're trying to speak a truth in that can help you be a better leader. They're not trying to attack you. They're trying to help you be a better person. And we don't need to belittle what they say. But we need to understand, it goes on and says, you need to show them honor as a weaker vessel. A lot of times we're like demanding respect and honor as being the husband because we've read that in, in Ephesians chapter 5. And we're like, you're supposed to honor me, but here scripture says that you're supposed to honor your wife as a weaker vessel and understand that they are your joint heir in the, uh, in the grace of life. Otherwise, your prayer will be hindered. And so God is like, look, if you don't honor my daughter, I ain't listening to you. I can tell you this, as a father who has three daughters, any of you guys who think you're going to date my daughter, first off, my oldest one still has three more years before any one of y'all even bother talking to her. I'm serious. I'm not it's, not, it's not a joke. <laughs> she can't get married. She's still got to graduate high school and everything. So you got three more years. And if you're not willing to wait the three more years, then you don't understand my daughter's value. Because all you're wanting to do is open up a can of worms that's going to lead to temptation, that's going to lead to struggle, that's going to lead to heartache and all of that. And you don't understand my daughter's value. And you need to just... Keep on walking. <laughs> I'm teaching the young men to, to honor and <laughs> the young women. But we need, to, we need to do that. Listen, if we want to receive honor, we got to show honor. A lot of times men would demand that somebody honors them. But we don't need to demand that somebody honors us. You never see where scripture where Jesus demanded anything of anybody. Jesus demonstrated and gave people the opportunity to reciprocate what he demonstrated. The second thing is this, is are you building up or are you tearing down your family? No, I don't think any man intentionally wants to tear their home apart. They don't set out to do it. They make a series of bad decisions or they make, uh, you know, they, they, they struggle with an area and don't want to confess what's going on or uh, a lot of ways the way that we tear down people is and our family is with our words. And that's why before he even gets into the roles of the family in Ephesians chapter 5, at the end of Ephesians chapter 4, he begins to address relationships and the way that things should go in, in, our, in our homes. And in verse 29, he says, you need to make sure that no corrupt communication comes out of your mouth. No corrupt talk should come out of your mouth. Only that which is good for build, building up and it fits the occasion that it might minister grace to the hearer. Right here, God gives us two filters for every bit of our communication that we, we uh, speak over our kids or we speak to our wives. One, is it building them up? Two, is it ministering grace to them? And if it is not building them up, or ministering grace to them, then you know what? It doesn't need to come out of our mouth. And some people look at this and they're just like, well, you're not supposed to say cuss words. That's bad words. That's corrupt. This is far greater than just curse words. This is negative talk. This is hurtful talk. This is sarcastic talk. Come on, sometimes you can say the right words, but you say it with sarcasm, and it completely twists everything that was just said. And God's saying that's not the way that we should talk. We should talk to people in a way that builds each other up and administers grace. Verse 30 says, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by which you were sealed in the day of redemption. See, so many times we think that we're going to grieve the Spirit of God by some sin that we have in our life or we're going to grieve the Spirit of God. You know, a lot of times more charismatic faiths and stuff say you, you're grieving the Spirit of God if you're not shouting and running and speaking in tongues and stuff in church, but that's not what this context is about. At all. This context is all about in your relationships. And what grieves the Spirit of God is when you speak negative over people. You speak down to people. You belittle people. And you tear other people down. 
I want to encourage you something, guys. A lot of times you'll have people who will speak negative and tear other people apart and all that. And I want to encourage you, don't get caught up in that at all. Choose to believe the best in people and speak life over people instead of speaking death. Because you can tear your family down with your words. And in context, it grieves the Holy Spirit when you tear people down with your words. It goes on and begins to address a lot of times why we tear people down, why we speak down to people. And most of the time, the reason why we speak down to people is because we're not happy with ourselves and there's something that's going on inside of our hearts that we're not happy with, and so we try to bring everybody down to our level. And a lot of times, the area that's the struggle is anger. I'm telling you, two of the biggest things that men struggle with is lust and anger. Just about every man is going to struggle with at least one of those two things. And a lot of times the reason why they struggle in the area of anger is because they try to suppress all their emotions. They try to suppress all their hurt. Pretend like, you can't hurt me. There's nothing you can say. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. And we hear all of those things. And so we push everything down. And then we're a bunch of big, broken, wounded men who have all kinds of issues in our heart that God needs to deal with. And that's why Paul, after he says this, don't grieve the Spirit of God by tearing people down with your words and all of that, he goes in and he says, and let all bitterness, let all wrath, let all anger, let all clamor and slander, that's tearing other people down, be put away from you along with all malice. And instead of doing that, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, not hard-hearted. <laughs> the problem is a lot of us, our heart is so hard because we've done that to try to protect ourselves so that we don't get hurt again. And the problem is, is it comes out in the thing of anger. And as we suppress all of those things down and push it down and push it down and push it down, we push it down until one day we blow up. And the biggest problem is, is the most of the time when we blow up, it's with the people that are close to us and we blow up on our wife or we blow up on our kids. And they're not even the people that we're angry with. But they're the casualties of war. Because we didn't deal with the issues that are going on in our heart. It tells us that we need to forgive one another as Christ and Jesus, as God in Christ has forgiven you. I'm telling you, men, all the grudges, all the bitterness, all the unforgiveness, all the anger, all those issues, you've got to begin to deal with that. And I'm not saying get a big group of men and sit around and hold hands and, and, and sing kumbaya and pass the tissues and, and all this stuff about every wound and every hurt and everything that's ever happened in your life and all of those things. But what I am saying is you better find somebody that you can talk to about this. And it's not a sign of weakness to realize that you got brokenness in your life and you need to get it fixed. That's actually a sign of strength. When it's because you're walking in humility, and that's what brings God's grace. But when you keep saying, oh, I got this, I can handle this, I'm good, that's pride. And that's when God's in opposition. And I'm going to tell you one of the best people to go to to talk about the hurts and wounds and pains that are in your life is the person that you stood beside and said, I do to. Because I can tell you this, I was messed up. And now I am slightly less messed up. <laughs> but when I started doing better with the areas of anger and all of those things, was when I realized that my wife, that God put her there to be a helper, to be somebody who would walk with me through things and, and pray with me through things and stuff. And I began to talk to her about some of the things that, 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 that were hurt and sin pains and, and things like that, that that had been inflicted into my heart and into my life and just had her pray with me and begin to encourage me and all of those things. But one of the biggest things that men are afraid of is intimacy. I was reading this book one time that said, you know, really the way that you could pronounce intimacy for men as to why they're afraid of it is into me see. They're afraid if people really knew what was going on on the inside, that they wouldn't want to be around them. Here's the thing. Your wife said that they would be with you through good times and bad times. 
till death do you part. And if nobody else sees the inside of you, you need to begin to share those things with your wife so that you can bring healing into your life so that you don't blow up on her and you don't blow up on your kids the way that many of us do. We've got to begin to deal with those family issues, those wounds that have been in our heart. Third thing is this, is are you laying down your life for your bride? You know, we read Ephesians 5, 22 through 24, but the very next verse begins to shift the focus, and it says, Husbands, you need to love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. That word, as Christ loved, means the same way that Christ loved. It means to, the, to follow the example that Jesus set. Jesus set the example of, of selflessness. Jesus set the example of self-sacrifice in order to better his bride. That's why he went to the cross and was beaten and rejected and mocked. and He left heaven and all of those things to come down here because he wanted to restore his bride to what God desired for them to be. And so he selflessly gave up worship and streets of gold and the throne of, uh, of being in the presence of God and on his throne and everything in order to come down and lead and in Philippians, Paul tells us in verse 5, he says, you need to have this same mind among you. If you read the two verses before, we looked at them last week. He says, don't look out for the interest of others, but look out, uh, or don't look out for the interest of yourself, but look out for the interest of others, and even consider others as better than yourself. And he says, that's the mind that Christ had. And, and he goes on and elaborates even more, and he says, even though he was in the form of God, he didn't uh, count equality with God as something to be grasped. But he emptied himself, taking on the form of a servant. Not the form of a dictator. Not the form of a king. He took on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. Left angels circling around him. Day and night worshiping him. People bowing at his feet. He left all of that to come into service. And it says, being found in human form. He humbled himself to be obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And if I ask this question today, let me ask you, how many of you men in here, you would die to protect your family and your wife? Whatever it took. Somebody breaks into your house, you may not have a gun or whatever, you're going to do whatever it takes. You're going to throw stuff, you're going to grab stuff, start swinging, you're going to poke them in the eyeballs, you're going to bite them, kick them, whatever it takes. Because you're not going to let anything hurt your wife. You're not going to let anything or anyone come in and, and attack your kids without having to first go through you. But here's the thing, most of the time that God doesn't call us to physically die to protect our family. But I can tell you this, he will call you to emotionally die to your needs, your desires, your dreams, your plans, your will, your way in order to protect your family. He would call you to die to your comfort in order to protect your family. You know what that means? Sometimes you've got to have tough conversations with your kids and not go off on them. Sometimes you've got to hear the dirty things and mistakes and faults and failures that they've done. In the same way that Jesus loves us and forgives us in spite of all of the failures that we've done, we've got to be willing to hear it and say, listen, I still love you. What you've done does not define who you are. But who you are needs to define what you do. And you're a child of God. Your value is too far. Jesus went to the cross to die for you. Jesus went to the cross to set you free. You're too good to be in that scenario and stuff. You need to be begin to walk as God created you to God's got plans and purpose and destiny and future. You don't need to waste it on these silly boys. Because that's all they are, boys. Girls, teenage girls, I'm telling you, you don't need none of these silly boys right now. I'm telling you, you fall in love with your daddy? You fall in love with your heavenly father? And then one day I tell my girls, I'm like, hey, one day, if your dad ever says that some guy is good enough for you, then you know that's God. Marry them. <laughs> but I take my daughters out when they turn 13. 
because they're entering into adulthood. And I give them a ring. And I tell them, I'm going to watch over your heart. And I want you to have this ring and understand, I'm giving you to this as a, as a covenant and a promise that I'm going to watch over you and I'm going to guard you and I need you to allow me to do that because I want to protect you from what the world wants to do to you. And if there is ever anybody that God convinces me is good enough for you, then on your wedding day you can give me back this ring and you can put the ring on and enter into covenant with that man. And I tell him, let me, let me guard your heart. Men, we've got to start laying down our life to protect our families. You know, in old English days, how many of you heard stories about King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table? That whole mindset that we call chivalry. Chivalry was based, it was a Christian belief based out of Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. That husbands are called to fight for and protect and lay down their life for their lady. And in the act of chivalry, chivalry was something that every person, every one of those knights that were sitting around the, the, the round table, every one of those knights had committed their allegiance and their promise to protect some lady no matter what it took, no matter what the cost. They had to fight a fire-breathing dragon. Then they were going to put up their shield and they were going to go fight that fire-breathing dragon. But they were going to lay down their life to protect their lady. And the way that they were knighted was not that a king would knight them and appoint them. They would give their sword to their lady. And then they would kneel before their lady and the lady would tap the shoulders. You've seen it in the movies. And then tap the head. And then would turn the sword back with the handle and say, now go fight for me. And that man would take up that sword for a full commitment to fight for his lady. Now everywhere else in the world, there was a completely different mentality and mindset. And that mentality and mindset was called machismo. It's where we get the word macho. I'm man, I'm strong, I'm tough. I'm up here, woman, you're down here. I'm here for you to serve me. You walk behind me. You wash my clothes, have my kids, cook me dinner. And your whole life is to do nothing but serve me. I think it's interesting that Christ could have came down to earth with the mindset of, you're here to serve me. Now bow down at my feet, do what I say, obey my words. But he didn't. He came down, and instead of demonstrating, you're here to serve me, he said, I'm here to serve you. I'm going to go to the cross for your sin. I'm going to heal your diseases. I'm going to provide for your needs. And in fact, and at the Last Supper, he gets down and he takes up the towel and he washes his disciples' feet. And then he looks at them and says, hey, no servant's greater than the master. The thing you just seen me do, do, you need to do that. He didn't call him to lead as a dictator. He called him to lead as a servant. That's what it said. He came from heaven to earth in the form of of a servant to lay down his life for us. 
Jesus demonstrated and gives us the opportunity to reciprocate what he demonstrates. Think about this in 1 John 4, 19. It says what? We love him, why? Because he first loved us. Who moved first? Jesus did. If you look at the example that Jesus set, Jesus moved first, Jesus loved first, Jesus served first, Jesus honored first. And because of what he did, we have the opportunity to reciprocate what he's done in our lives. And that's exactly what God calls men to do. He calls you to move first. You honor first. You serve first. You love first. And when you do that, your wife and your kids will see the example that's in you. And they will reciprocate it back. Well, how do you know that's going to work? Because Scripture talks about how you reap what you sow. That whatever you sow, that that's going to, what you're going to reap. And, and even in uh, Luke chapter 6, it, it talks about how uh, that, that, that uh, wh whatever we sow, that, that we will reap, and it will be pressed down, shaken together, and running over, and men pour into our bosom. And a lot of times we use that as money, but if you look at the context of it, pull up verse 37, it says, Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you won't be condemned. Pardon, and you will be pardoned. It's not talking about money. It's talking about your relationships. Are you sowing judgment? Are you sowing condemnation? Or are you showing grace and pardoning somebody in their shortcomings? And when you sow pardon and grace, you receive pardon and grace. Given it would be given to you, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, will men pour into your bosom? For with the standard that you measure, it will be measured back to you. If you love, you are in love. If you give, it will be given back to you. Serve, people will serve. So we know the what, but we have to understand the why. And I think if you go back to the very Garden of Eden, God looked down and he saw man, he saw man alone. He said, it's not good that man should be alone. So I'm going to create a help meet. Anybody in here ever used the word help meet except for when you're referring to this scripture? That's not a word that we use. Some translations, well, I'm, going to, I'm going to create a helper. Listen, even helper is a bad translation. It's a poor, it's a limited translation of what really meant. I had a Bible college professor who, he speaks Spanish and French and all these different languages and he studies Hebrew and all of this stuff. And he said, the translation that he likes the most on that verse is the French translation. Because the French translation translates it an aide semblant or an aid in resemblance of you. So God gave Adam and Eve so that he could lead in a way that Eve would be a resemblance of him. Think about this. What did Jesus do? Ephesians chapter 5, verse 26. It says the reason why he laid down his life for the church is so that he would sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water of the word, that he may present the church in all the splendor without wrinkle or spot, that she might be holy and without blemish. What's he doing? He's trying to make the church look like him. That's what Paul said in Romans chapter 8. That whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed into the image of his son. That Jesus would be the firstborn among many brethren. In other words, God's desire is that the people in his church look like Jesus. And when the Father takes up that call to be like Jesus and serve and love and honor, then he raises up a family of people who serve and love and honor who look like Jesus and men one day you get to stand before God and you get to say God you entrusted me with your most valuable possession not of money not of riches not of wealth not of fame but of people you entrusted me with my wife my four kids and I did my part to look like you and lead like you so that they can look like you. And I brought them all here with me, God. And I'm returning to you the thing that you gave me to steward. 
and you get to hear God say, well done, my good and faithful. Enter into the kingdom of God. And here's the thing, you get to take your whole family in with you. What better way to spend eternity than to know everybody that you were responsible for in your family, that they're all right there with you. You can enjoy the goodness and presence of God for all eternity with them. I'm telling you, it's far worth the inconveniences, the heartaches, the swallowing your pride. When you that's that's temporary compared to the eternal results of being able to, to return your family to God and say, I got them all right here. They're here to serve you. Again, thanks so much for tuning in today. We hope that you've enjoyed this message and that you felt the presence of God right where you are. If you did enjoy it, we'd love to see you live at one of our campuses. Mount Hope meets at 9, 11, and 5, and Summersville meets at 11. We'll see you there.